Mina, Konbanwa, Jesus Freaking Gamer here, back with 2 Chronicles 15 Part 2. I decided after all, yep, I'm going to do this. This is important. This is something that needs to be done. There is a lot of really good stuff in this particular chapter, and there's one topic, as you'll see in the title of this message, that I'm going to be devoting a good amount of time to. I may or may not finish up chapter 15. There may or may not be a part three. I don't know at this point because I'm just recording this. I There's no editing, unfortunately, involved. My editor is still not quite, not my editor is in a person, but my editing software is still not in a position where I can use it to the best of my ability, as, as in I, I can't use it at all right now. So this is completely unedited. This is me from beginning to end. So I don't know if there will be a part three. I just know, I knew from the beginning what the topic would be about. That's how I know what the message or the title is going to be based on the message. And it has a lot to do with the Bible itself, the Word of God. We Christians say it's the Word of God. Not everyone agrees with that. So let's go ahead and jump right into this. We're going to back up to, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to back up to 2 Chronicles 15, verse 8. And that's what's going to kick this whole thing off. I could have used so many passages, particularly in the first nine chapters of 1 Chronicles, where it's just talking about names, genealogies, histories, arrangements, assortments, etc. So we're going to do that. We're going to, we're, I'll talk about that briefly, and it's going to be kind of bounced off of this one verse that I'm going to read here, verse 8. And I'm also going to try to read with the Bible up here from now on, because... After all this time, I've been looking at my videos, and it's finally hit me. Y'all, you guys get to see the bottom of my head in like every single one of my uh, Bible messages. Do, does it does it look good? Does the bottom of my the bottom of my head? Is this the bottom? Is this the bottom? What is the bottom of my head? Anyway, you get to see this all the time, and and I'm just like, you know, that's not very personable. I'm not really looking at the camera, so right here, you see a little bit of Bible at the bottom of the of the screen. You see my eyes like. Boop, boop, go back and forth between y'all, between the Bible itself. I think this is a little bit more appropriate. I think it's a little bit more personable. There's nothing wrong with what I did before, but it's just, I don't know, from a filming perspective, I think this is preferable. And why it took me this long to figure it out, I don't know. Because I'm figuring out YouTube as I go, and I'm not thinking of a ton of things in advance. That's why. So all of that aside, let's hop into this. Verse 8, And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim. And he restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. All of that is verse 8. I'm focusing on the very beginning. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, now you back up to verse 1, Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah the son of Oded, well, it would be easy enough to say that, oh, well, look, here's a clear contradiction in Scripture. And first I want to say to the Christians who would look at this and simply say that's not a contradiction. It's Azariah, the son of Oded. Obvious. It's very, very obvious what this passage is talking about, who this passage is referring to. And they could even explain it as saying, you know, well, sometimes the Israelites in their genealogies and in their references, they will talk about a grandfather and refer to it as a father. They will refer to one man's sayings as the sayings of his son or his father. I may not be quoting this exactly correct, and I'm not quoting any particular scholar. But these kinds of things are said in seminaries and in churches, and I want to take my stand right here and say that is simply incorrect. It is a contradiction. It is an error, and it is wrong. And that'll, uh, for those of you who are Christians, would you please not click away on this video, hit the dislike button, would you please, at least not immediately, please hear me out and let me finish. That's my one plea. I'm going to be referencing a video a lot longer than this. You'll see it in the description down below. Um, so if you want a much longer explanation, you are absolutely free and welcome to look at that. In fact, I would highly recommend it, but please give me at least the first few minutes to to defend where I'm coming from and to defend my position. Please don't discredit me and write me off just yet. As though the cursing in my video game videos isn't enough to discredit me in several Christians' eyes. But I digress. 
in my eyes and in my mind this is a clear-cut contradiction it is a it is an error and in my Bible this particular copy of the New King James second Chronicles chapter 15 verse 8 next to Oded there is a little letter a um, at the end of the of the bleh, English at the end of the word and it's slightly elevated so you know it's not like Odeda but it's Oded with a and 158a at the bottom of the page says following Masoretic text and Septuagint Syriac and Vulgate read Azariah the son of Oded compare verse 1 and that in my mind solidifies why this is a typo or a mistake or an error now for clarification a lot of you have no idea what I'm talking about and a lot of you may not even care to me this is one of the nearest and dearest issues of my heart in regards to my Christianity searching for an answer to this took me a really really long time and a lot of soul searching for the very simple reason that if there is a mistake in scripture it cannot be trusted it isn't the word of God if it is not perfect like the God who spoke it a lot of liberals and skeptics will use far more complicated arguments than this to say that the word of God is flawed it has contradictions it has mistakes and errors and is not to be trusted. They will use far bigger examples than this and, and more multitudinous. Because I am including a simple, I'm going to use, I don't think the word typo is exactly correct, but I'm going to use the word typo nonetheless for this example. And maybe the first explanation used by several Christian scholars could explain it very simply, very easily, and concisely in the context of writing the Old Testament. Maybe that is simply how the Hebrews wrote. To write someone as saying something and it was actually their father or their son, that was completely and totally acceptable back in Old Testament writings and times. Perhaps that is correct. And if so, then I am incorrect about this particular passage. I will say that there are verses in the Old and New Testaments, the more complicated examples that I mentioned earlier, that are clear-cut typos or contradictions and if and if simply stating this wasn't enough to make it a contradiction what do you have down at the bottom let me unpack that a little bit the Masoretic text and Septuagint Syriac and Vulgate what those are are four ancient editions of the Old Testament the Masoretic text is the text handed down by the Masoretes that was a group of Jews who hand trans not translated hand transcribed the word of god the old testament all the way up into the thousand ad's so a really really long time they had they made a copy for one generation then the next generation made a copy the next generation made a copy the next generation made a copy it's copies of copies of copies a lot of liberals are quoted as saying copies of copies of copies to discredit the Old and New Testaments. Historically speaking, I have nothing to say to refute it. That is indeed how the Old and New Testaments were handed down. Copies of copies of copies. That doesn't necessarily, in my opinion, make it non-biblical, make it less the Word of God. And that's going to be the ultimate end of this topic. That's why I'm asking you to hear me out until the end here it is obvious by all the messages that I preach and it's obvious by the name of this channel it didn't change with the production of this particular message this is not a new revelation that radically changed my worldview and made me a non-believer I was aware of this information several years ago and like I said it took me several years to really find a solid answer and this is one of the reasons that I lost my faith. There, there were several reasons at the time why I, I didn't stop believing in Jesus, but I stopped living as a Christian. I stopped actively praying, reading my Bible, etc., going to church. This was one of the reasons because I did not have a clear-cut answer. And actually, I came back to Jesus before I had a very clear-cut answer. For me, faith preceded logic and reason. I don't think it necessarily has to be so in order to be a believer. 
In fact, I think good apologetics and polemics, that is a defense of the faith and an offense against other faiths. Apologetics being the defense, polemics being the offense. I think sometimes those are excellent tools and keys that can be used to promulgate the faith. It can bring people to faith in Christ and away from faith in other religions. I think those are incredibly useful tools. I have a great interest and love and a bit of a passion for those two things, especially apologetics, especially the defense of the faith. Moving on to an explanation. So the Masoretic text passed down by the Masoretes, a sect of Hebrews. There was the Septuagint. That was the Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew and Aramaic. Those were the two original languages that the Old Testament Bible was written in. Hebrew and Aramaic. Aramaic, very, very sparse parts. Um, I want to say um, a good, the second half of the book of Daniel, a few verses in Jeremiah, and perhaps a spattering, I'm not sure, in Ezra and Nehemiah. Very, very minor and minute. The vast majority was written in Hebrew, but there was some Aramaic in there. And at the time of Jesus and the apostles, some P, I forget which group of people it was, but they took it upon themselves to translate the Hebrew and Aramaic into the common language of the time, which was Greek. That way, a broader audience would have access to the Word of God, which I think is a very, very good thing. Um, I'm glad the Bible is in English, and I don't need to be fluent in Hebrew and Greek with a spattering of Aramaic to understand what I believe to be the divinely inspired Word of God. I'm glad there is an English translation of said word. And I think the Septuagint was probably a very good idea. And knowing the Septuagint exists answers quite a few questions. When you look in the New Testament and you see other typos and mistakes, where Jesus or one of the apostles would quote the Old Testament, but the quote's not quite correct, Actually, if you look at the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, which was the same Koine Greek or the common Greek that the New Testament was written in, and you line up the New Testament quote with the Septuagint, they line up letter for letter and word for word. Jesus and the apostles were not misquoting or making up some mystical analogy. They were quoting the Bible of their day, the Septuagint. And at this point, let me just say, I know what I'm saying right now could hurt the faith of some Christians. I will not apologize for saying what I'm saying because a faith built on sand is going to collapse eventually anyway. What I want is a faith built upon sound bedrock, something that won't be shaken and won't be moved by the storms and the raging winds of this life that the devil loves to kick up to destroy believers. I'm going to get to an answer, so if, if I've hooked you at this point, please continue watching and don't quit. Please watch, and if this message goes over 30 minutes, I will try to keep it to 30 minutes. If I do not, please bear with me because this is one of the keystone messages of this channel. The first and foremost is that God loves you. It was the first message I preached. This is probably the second most important message. And yes, I will say the love of God is more important than the reason and the evidence that I'm about to present to you. I think the love of God is the most important thing. To understand that you're loved and that God loves you and has a plan for your life, I think takes precedence even over is the Bible, the Word of God. Feel free to disagree with me. They are both foundations to my faith and in my heart and life. They are both absolutely important, and I would not still be a Christian if it weren't for this evidence and faith. So don't get me wrong. The love may be the most important, but it's not the only important thing. So moving along, the Syriac, that is another language. The Syriac is another translation of the Old Testament into the Syriac language. And it is highly respected and used in Old Testament translation as a comparative text 
I don't believe it has quite the weight of the Septuagint in determining what scholars believe are the actual words of the Old Testament. The Masoretic text has the most weight as far as what scholars believe to be the most important and the most reliable. But in certain instances, like the Syriac and the Vulgate, read Azariah the son of Oded and not just Oded. So because of such variations and because, in, in my opinion, the Syriac and the Vulgate are simply correct, whereas the Masoretic Text and the Septuagint are missing out on some words. Masoretic Text and Septuagint are older and more reliable, but I quite frankly think they left out some words. And I'm going to get to that in just a minute. Finally, the Vulgate, the, uh, the, the scholar Jerome in the, I want to say it was the 4th or 5th century A.D., he was a bishop of the Roman Catholic Church, and he translated, once again, the entire Bible. But, of course, since he was a Christian, not just the Old Testament, the New Testament as well, he translated the entire thing into the common tongue of that day. It was Latin. And the Vulgate was used pretty much up until the Reformation times, the Protestants, when they broke away from the Catholic Church and they started translating the Bible into the languages of of their of their of their cultures and of their countries the catholic church was saying that the vulgate was the word of god that it was the reliable word of god you didn't need anything else the protestants were like we want the bible in our own language not just a language that only scholars only monks and priests understand we want the common people to be able to read it and interpret it and understand it for themselves and we believe that'll be great for the understanding of the message and the gospel and the word of god in general that it will lead to a godlier civilization and to more salvations among individual human beings. And I would, I am a Protestant and a charismatic, non denominational Protestant on top of that. I would agree with that viewpoint. I think it is a great thing, like I said earlier, to translate the Bible into my language, English, and I think it's a great thing to translate the Bible into the languages of the people. I agree wholeheartedly with the Protestant reformers that it is a key integral tool to converting the masses and making the Word of God commonly, widespreadly known. So we have four ancient editions. Um, the Vulgate would be the newest one out of all those editions, and it started in the 5th century. The others, to the best of my knowledge, predate that. I don't know how, by how much. On that point, you will need someone far more scholarly and erudite than I. But the Vulgate is the newest out of those four, but all four are consulted in the translating of the Old Testament. So here's a news flash to the uninformed. The Old and the New Testaments aren't based on just one solid document. There isn't a one word of God. There isn't just one copy of the entire Bible that's completely error-free, contradiction-free, there are several different things throughout. Sometimes, in my reading of the Bible, the Masoretic text seems correct over the other three. Sometimes the Septuagint, sometimes the Syriac, sometimes the Vulgate. And the New Testament has two primary texts that scholars use, not four. Of course, obviously, they're much more recent because the texts they're translating are much newer by thousands of years. They're only 2,000 years old, not a potential 4,000 or older years old. So those texts are, in, they are more numerous and they are more reliable. When you hear of the Bible having tens of thousands of texts, that's referring to the Greek New Testament. That actually is not taking the Old Testament texts into account at all. But there are over 10,000 manuscripts, some in part, some full, in all of various ages and um, accuracy of the New Testament. And throughout the Old and the New Testament, there are contradictions, there are complications. Once again, there is not one text that just plain lies out what the Word of God should be. So... And like I said earlier, that there are much more complicated issues. Much like this is one of the simplest texts to look at and talk about because there are texts with a very obvious correction. And there, so and even if there was no correction at all, if it was simply a typo, it would be very obvious 
what this verse was referring to based on just a few verses up ahead. This is, excuse me, this is um, 2 Chronicles 15, 8. Verse 1 lays out exactly who said this prophecy. So this is not a problem. There are much, much more complicated issues in the Old and New Testaments. There are, to give you the two big examples, and they're both in the New Testament. I don't know why I'm flipping there. I know this by heart. Mark chapter 16, verses 9 to the end of the chapter. Um, according to several scholars, I think at this point the mainstream of scholars, Mark 16, 9 through 20, through the end of the chapter, those verses don't exist in what they believe to be the most reliable Greek manuscripts. That also includes John 7.53 through 8.11. And that story is the well-beloved story of Jesus and the adulterous woman. Those same manuscripts also do not have that story at all. That story is supposedly superfluous. And it does not belong in the New Testament. Again, I know I'm... If some, pe some people may listen to this and be taking it very seriously. Some people may just be like, oh, who cares, so hum. They've probably already clicked away from the video. People who are watching at this point probably really care. And I might have just shattered some faiths, some hopes and dreams. Please listen to me through the end of this message and don't stop. Please give me some more of your time. And on top of these verses, there are other verses without a clear textual answer. There are more problems past those. Those are the biggest chunks that are up for debate. There are several other passages. They're small, but they're of greater importance than like this again. You look at verse 1 as opposed to verse 8, and it's very obvious who actually said this prophecy. In fact, there are two ancient witnesses, the Syriac and the Vulgate, that say Azariah, the son of Oded. So even if you couldn't somehow figure it out, if there was only one, if there was no textual variant, if all four texts said the same thing, it would still be very obvious what the text meant. Well, there's even a textual variant that says, oh, by the way, here's what we say. It should say. And a textual variant is just that. It is a variant. It varies from one text to another. There is a variation in what one text says the Bible should say as opposed to what another text says. So it varies. Therefore, it is a textual variant. Some, some very important. This one, not so much. Therefore, it makes an excellent example, as I've said numerous times already. Some are incredibly important, and entire books have been written on these particular points. What I'm looking for in this message is an overarching point. I'm looking for something very, very specific. And I'm looking for something that you can home in on and believe. And that was this point that I'm about to make. And you're going to have to make up your own mind as to what you believe. At this point, um, there's really no denying the truthfulness of the copies of copies of copies. That is how the text was translated. And as Christians, we have no right or reason to hide from that truth. Historically, there is absolutely no denying that that's what happened. There's also no denying that there are textual variants. Even if there was somehow one absolute word of God that we knew this was the text, this was the truth, this is right, all the others are wrong, it wouldn't change the fact that there were mistranslations, that there were misquotes, that there were differences of opinion at some point. The biggest problem is that we don't have an absolute measure on what is and what isn't the Word of God, on what verses are and are not correct, on what verses should and should not be in the Bible. What we do have are scholars who have studied their entire lives to find out which text is right as opposed to which text is wrong, which text is best, and which text is worse. We have paleontologists. I'm sorry, that, that's dinosaurs. What am I talking about? Archaeologists, um, history hunters, who have, again, devoted their entire lives to digging up ancient stuff, um, texts, pots, jars, etc., 
And they, they want to find this history. They want to discover, biblical and otherwise, what happened in the ancient world. History consumes them and is their passion, and they love it, and they devote their lives to it. And they dig up these things, and more and more texts are discovered. Um, primarily New Testament, but some Old Testament stuff as well. You hear about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Those were some Old Testament texts dug up that predated what we had by over a thousand years. That's why it was such a big deal. That's why it was such a huge discovery, because now we have texts 1,000 years older than what we previously had. To sum it up, when you look at all of it, and I'm going I'm to make a, a clearer point near the end of this. I want to give a general point or a few general points, and then I'll wrap it up into a very specific point that kind of sealed the deal for me. I don't. It's not like all of my questions are answered, but I would dare to say at this point in my life, the big question is answered. What we have are hundreds and thousands of texts all saying a bunch of contradictory things, all saying something slightly different from the next. So how do you determine the truth in the middle of all of these texts? Well, one, there is no text more reliable or more preserved than our Bible, Old and New Testament. New Testament primarily, but the Old Testament counts as well. With the number of copies we have of both Testaments, it is the most attested to historical document out of any book in all of human history. And what that means is with all of the testimonies, with all of the texts, in the middle of all the variants, if we don't know what the Old Testament and the New Testament are saying, especially the New Testament, then we don't know what any historical book is saying. If we can't trust the text of the New Testament and the Old Testament, then we cannot trust the veracity and the historicity of a single historical text documented prior to the printing press in the 15th century. We can't trust anything historically up to that point to be valid or correct, and we would have to doubt all of human recorded history up to the printing press. And there's, there are a few scholars that have adopted, you know, we don't know history. We are skeptical of everything. Um, we're complete and total skeptics, and we really don't know what the heck is going on. There are some scholars who have adopted that viewpoint. Um, I guess you would call them the most stringent of agnostics. They're not only agnostic about God, they're agnostic about... Generally, those people tend to be agnostic about everything. Like, is this world real? Am I real? Are my own thoughts my own thoughts? You know, thought may be real, but am I the one thinking them? Like, they literally doubt everything. Some people adopt that point of view. Maybe you have that point of view. What I would ask as a Christian is that you would come to a point in your mind, in your heart, in your life where you would look at something with good evidence. Maybe not 100% ironclad evidence, but you would look at something with a lot of evidence and you would make a decision and say, Here's my judgment on the matter. Here's what I believe to be true. I'm not going to hate you for remaining agnostic, even if you die an agnostic. I'm not going to personally hate you for that. I, don't, I can't speak for any other Christian, but I can tell you that I personally will not hate you for staying an agnostic to the very end. I will be your friend. I will dialogue with you. I will discuss with you. I will hang out with you. I will play Mortal Kombat with you or any other Steam game that I happen to play on my channel with my subscribers and even just non-subscribers, just people who want to play along with me. I have no problem with that, and I won't hate you or discriminate you based on that. I will tell you you're wrong and that I disagree with you, and I think I have good evidence to support that. But just like jurors looking at a trial, in the case of God, you can declare a mistrial if you want and leave it unresolved and remain agnostic. I would urge you and encourage you to look at the evidence and actually make a decision. The Bible is accurate or it is not. Not just say, I don't know. The Bible is accurate or it is not. God is real, he is not. Jesus is Lord or he is not. Look at the evidence and make an intelligent, educated judgment based on the evidence that you have and based on the best of your intellectual ability and faith at this point. Um, 
To those of you who would say faith is dead, I would say you don't even know who your parents are. You don't know if your thoughts are your own. You don't know if this world is real. You don't know if the chair you're going to sit in is going to fall on you or not. You believe those things are true. You think those things are correct. You don't actually know. Not at the very, as far as absolutely 100% proving these things, I would be, I guess the word skeptical, it's weird to say a skeptical belief, but that sounds very contradictory. But I would say without faith it is impossible to assert those things and to say that those things are true. You can't assert and claim your own thoughts, your own existence, your own reality without faith. So if you're going to say that those things are real, let me challenge you to take that faith. And it is faith. Faith and belief, are, they mean the exact same thing. In the Greek, they were even the same word. The Greek that my Bible uses. Choose to believe one more thing. Take it one step further. Don't just be content with saying, I'm real. My thoughts are real. Reality is real. Take it a step further. Say that God is real. That he might have, he might have just tried communicating with us. Take it one step further. Even if you can't take the plunge and say Jesus is Lord, take your faith one step further. And on to what I would say is, this has all been a summary. I'm going to link in the description down below a debate between Drs. James White and Bart Ehrman. Um, Bart Ehrman is probably the most reputable non-Christian scholar in regards to textual criticism and the Word of God of the current day. James White I had honestly never heard of prior to this debate and he won so much respect from me um, in this debate because it was his point that I believe to be true and it came it came to the point where I looked at the, the just the simple logic of it and I was like you know that's a really good point and here it is and I'm gonna use the Religion of Islam and their holy book, the Quran, as my, I guess, antithesis. With the Bible, I've already discussed, you have copies of copies of copies, thousands, tens of thousands even, of various texts, textual variants, just out, out of the door, through the roof. Um, almost more, I would dare say more than one human being could possibly look at or comprehend and make a judgment call and say, okay, this is right, this is right, this is wrong, this is right, this is wrong, 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 this is right, this is right, this is wrong, this is right, and do that. The between all between tens of thousands of texts, and you have so many texts saying multiple different things, we're talking hundreds of thousands, even millions, of various calls and texts that need to be looked at. I don't think a single human being could do this in, with their entire... If they were born fluent in Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, Latin, Syriac, <clears throat> and all the other ancient languages, I don't think they could possibly, within a human lifespan of 100 years, look at everything and make an individual judgment call. This is, demands a team of scholars. And then, so that's the Bible, then you have the Quran. Um, I free, James White goes into detail on this, but there was one man who codified the Quran and said, okay, here's the text. Um, and that text was kept, and it was copied exclusively from. So the text of the Quran, I'm sure there are variants in various copies here and there, but there is like a one text you can go to. Like, here's the text. If the, you, know, you look at this newer copy, you look at this translation, and they also don't like to use translations very much. They very much so prefer to use the original Arabic that the Quran was written in. They have an original they can go back to and say, here's the text. Here it is. Right here. And your first thought is, well, that's great. Why don't we have that as Christians? That, that's a great text. I'm converting to Islam right now. Hold your horses. Hold on to them for just a second longer. Hear me out. Since they only have that one text, you're placing all of your bets, all of your faith, everything on what that one, I want my camera, my hand in the camera in frame, you're placing all of your bets on what that one human said, here's what Muhammad said, here's the word of Allah, here's what's right, follow this. 
you're placing all of your, because we don't have Muhammad's written text. It was one of the, I even forget the name of their rulers, but it was the name of one of the rulers of a certain nation. And he just said, here it is. So it's not Muhammad's text. It's not the original text. And by the way, having an, saying that the autograph or the original text are infallible is pretty pointless if you don't have it and can't look at it and back it up. That applies to Christianity, Islam, and every other faith in creation. Um, except for the most modern faiths that have come about since the printing press, we do not have the original document. And that's the simple truth of the matter. You're placing all your bets on that one text. He had better have gotten it right or you're done. It's wrong forever because it is codified. With the Bible, we don't have a single solitary authority saying, here's the word of God, here's what Paul, Peter, James, Matthew, Mark, and going older, Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Moses. You're not having one source taking all of those books and saying, here is the one book, follow this, you have a b bunch of people, believers in, in, the Jewish, in the Jewish God and in the Christian God, who I would, of course, say are the same God. You have them just writing it down you know, from their home, not scholars. In some cases, there were scholars. In a lot of cases, they were just people who wanted to spread the word of God, especially in the New Testament times. Um, you just had believers who wanted to get the gospel out and the word of God out. And they didn't even think of it as the Word of God originally. Back when they first wrote it, it wasn't thought of as the Word of God on par with the Old Testament. Some Christians may think, well, oh my gosh, that's, that's horrible. Why didn't they immediately identify it as Scripture? Well, if you look at the history of the church, the New Testament, the, the, the people who were the disciples of the apostles, people like Polycarp, Justin Martyr, Ignatius, those uh, those original people, I'm trying to think, what was the very first? St. Clement. Those people, they talked, they quoted from the Old Testament primarily. They quoted from the Apocrypha a little bit. And every now and then you would hear a spattering of something Paul wrote. Or what you know Paul said Jesus wrote. They, and they would say Jesus said it because they believed they had faith that what was written down and, of course, they heard the apostles directly. They were the direct disciples of the apostles. They believed what the apostles said. And they believed in the writings of the apostles, which is a great proof for the veracity of the New Testament. But they didn't immediately just know, this is Scripture, this is the Word of God. If that crushes your faith, I'm very, very sorry. But historically speaking, if you look at those um, original church fathers, and I have read several of them, that simply was not the case. It became Scripture over the first 300 years of the church as the text was copied, transmitted by a bunch of home-brewed home believers, and it was thrown out into the masses. A lot more people got saved. They trusted in those documents, and they trusted in the teachers and in the bishops and the elders of the church who were quoting and who the first generation personally knew the apostles and had interacted with the apostles. And um, there was one church father, supposedly, who had even seen and heard Jesus alongside the apostles. I forget his name at the moment, um, but he had some unique sayings of Jesus not even found in Scripture. But he, he was personal friends with the apostles. He didn't make the cut of the twelve, but he was an original disciple of Jesus, an O.D. Um, I know I'm white, I'm sorry. <laughs> That sounded so incredibly bad, but he was an original disciple. He was, he was one of them alongside Peter, James, John, and all the other twelve. He just didn't have any biblical books written after him in his sayings, so they are relegated not as, um, as scripture, but as, they're relegated as church history, and, probably, and they were highly esteemed in the early church, along with the with, um with you know, the works of Polycarp and Clement. They were highly regarded and revered. And in one of the oldest New Testament scripts, the books of First and Second Clement, and I forget if there were any others, but they were written at the end of our New Testament. Kind of like they're a step below the New Testament, but they're also right beside it. 
because they were so highly esteemed. Again, this isn't this isn't in the bounds of dispute. This is history. So if this shatters your faith, I would plead with you, don't lose your faith yet. Think about this rationally and logically. This is simple history. And as Christians, as bearers of the truth, we need to confront the truth, you know, with the whole heart, with the whole mind, and not give up in the face of adversity. Rather, we need to look at the evidence and see what it presents to us and see the story that it tells. What we have, and here, here I'm going to wrap all this up. We're at 40 minutes. I told you I might, I, if I had to go over, I would. But this is so important. I want to do this in one go. You, you either have one text and you trust that one person to have codified it all right and gotten it all right, or you have hundreds and thousands of people. Yeah, there are differences of opinions, but you have those differences of opinions to go between, to um, basically check and balance with one another. And yes, I know I sound very, very American right now, and I am American. Um, but at the same time, would you take a second to see the beauty in that? We are humans. We are flawed. We do make mistakes. I don't think anyone of any religion or creed or stripe or race or gender or anything would disagree. All humans make mistakes. All humans are fallible. I guess some people think certain humans are infallible, and I would severely, highly disagree with those humans. All humans are fallible. All humans can make mistakes. All humans will fail you and disappoint you and mess up. And that's, that's me. That's, that's all of us. We're all going to make those mistakes. We're all going to make those failures. No one gets to sit on a throne and say, what I'm saying now is absolutely the truth. You don't have to check it. You don't have to look at it. You don't have to think about it. Take it to the bank right now. This is absolute truth. In my opinion, it was good that the New Testament went through checks and balances before it became the New Testament. It's good that the Old Testament was also checked and balanced by the old priests and rabbis. You know, well, like what prophets spoke and these prophets were the Word of God. And they were true from beginning to end to the best of our ability. Well, this guy passed the test. This guy didn't. There are certain um, works quoted in the, in the um, Old Testament, like the Book of Jasher and the Book of the Wars of Yahweh. They're quoted in the Old Testament so we know those quotes are true because they're in the Bible, but we don't have those books. They don't exist. And if they do exist, we don't have extant or complete copies of those books. They didn't make the cut. I'm sure they were good. They were probably relied upon in their day. Moses is the one who quoted those two books that I just talked about. But they didn't make the cut of Scripture. So... Some books made the cut, some books didn't. Someone, at some point, in all religions, um, in Islam it was one dude, in Christianity and Judaism it was several dudes. Someone, some human, had to say, this is the word of God, this is not. This is infallible, this is not. A human wrote the book, Yes, inspired by God, directly from the divine himself, but a human wrote it down, a human transcribed it, a human preserved it, and they did their, I'm going to assume that they did their best in all three of those capacities. But knowing the human potential to fail, I am much more comfortable, given a variety of human writings, instead of trusting just one person to get it right. Because I know of humans' abilities to fail, and because some human wrote it and said it was right and preserved it to begin with, since humans did all that, I'm much more comfortable with a variety of variants having to figure out the puzzle, so to speak. I'm much more comfortable with that, and it seems much more honest and open to critique than just one copy where you have to believe it or you're completely wrong. This is right, everything else is wrong, and everything is judged by this one measure. I don't trust any human with that level of authority and that level of power. I don't trust it. And that was the answer given to me in the debate I'm linking in the description below. It's the answer that really gave me, it was the ultimate answer to 
one of my ultimate questions. Can the Word of God be trusted? And looking at the evidence, looking at the way it was preserved, looking at what we have today, yes, we can trust it. It was well preserved. If you get rid of Mark if you get rid of Mark 16, 9 through 20, and John 7, 53 through 8, 11, if you get rid of all the variants and all the questions, um, there are still going to be a few things in the Bible, like no text says it's wrong. There are still going to be a few things that seem a bit off, seem a bit incorrect. And I'm just being completely honest here. And despite that, it is still like the most attested Bibli historical book you have probably over 40 writers over the span of about 4,000 years, and the contradictions and errors that are in there are so incredibly few, and most of them, the vast majority of them, are very easily answered and of non-consequence. That one verse that I pointed out, any other historical book other than the Bible, you would say, okay, we know exactly what the guy's talking about. We can jot that down as true moving along. But because it's the Bible, oh my gosh, it's a contradiction. Doubt it. No. It's pretty obvious what the guy meant. This is true. Move along. Well over 90%, and you can, I'm not, I'm not the only theologian who says this. You can have, you can, uh, I want to say that um, Dr. James White in this debate puts the number, the percentage of what is important versus what's not higher than 90%. Look at, I would highly encourage you to look at the message itself. It is two hours, 44 minutes, five seconds long. So it's, an, it's a huge investment of time, two hours roughly, just a little under, longer than this message here. But it is so telling. It's so revealing. And there, there, you have an intelligent man for the Christians and an intelligent man against the Christians. It will give you much more evidence to make up your mind on your own on this particular issue. I'm just, this is, believe it or not, a brief synopsis of that message there. And it's, this is all me. I'm not saying that what I'm saying is what they're saying or what I'm saying is endorsed by them. Th these are my thoughts and my takeaways from years of study, years of prayer, years of thinking, years of soul searching with this message as a capstone. But well over 90% of what's written between 40 authors is reliable. It's not overly important to the text. And none of it is important to the core message of who God is, who Jesus is, and to his resurrection. Those things are in plain sight <clears throat> not contradicted. The Old Testament led up to it and foreshadowed it. The New Testament recorded it and boldly proclaimed it. And it's the message that saved my life and my soul. And it's the message that can save your life and your soul too. Some of you, for anyone who watched this entire message, I have to say thank you so, so much. I want this message to be well received and liked and watched. I don't know how to make that happen. Just dear God in Jesus name of all the messages on my channel, would you please make this one a cornerstone and a capstone like it is in my heart. Would you please use this message to not destroy the faith of many, but to seal and strengthen the faith of dozens, even hundreds in the years to come in Jesus name. For some of you, this might have wrecked your faith. And if that's the case, my biggest concern isn't like, oh my gosh, I just sent someone to hell. My biggest concern is actually, did you listen to every word I said? Did you look at, listen to people other than me? Did you maybe watch the message in its entirety of what I redirected you to? Did you spend more than 50-ish minutes on this topic? Because 50 minutes on the topic of what is the Word of God and what isn't is a piddly parcel amount compared to what needs to be thought about prayed about and duly considered on this topic. This message is the result of, oh my gosh, 20 years of soul searching and praying and thinking. I've been a Christian for about 23, and I started taking these topics pretty seriously pretty early on. If it wasn't exactly 20, it's close to that. This, this is the summation of of 20 years of a layman's, well, I did go to seminary for a brief, but like I said, it wasn't accredited. I only have a diploma of theology. This is the, re this is the result of a tw about 20 years worth of a layman's looking into falling away and coming back to God, 
with this being one of the key points. I really want this message to be something that heals, a balm that soothes the wounds. I want this to be, you know, a shot in the face of the devil. I want this to be something that people can embrace and love. And I want this, I want my 20 years to be something that can guide and lead people so that they don't have to take 20 years of their life looking into this topic and debating and even falling away. I want this message to be something that people can look at and say, you know what? This points me to Christ. This points me to the Word of God. I think I can have a little bit more assurance and a little bit more faith. And I feel like I have some direction for this journey that I'm on because of this message. That's what I want this to be. And I hope that's what it is. If anything I said derailed someone's faith and tripped someone up, I hope it's not because I said something wrong or in error. I hope it's because they looked, they listened to what I said, they looked into the evidence for themselves, and they concluded, you know what? Brandon's wrong. God's wrong. Jesus is wrong. The Bible's wrong. I don't believe in it. And if that's the case, so be it. In fact, I will salute you for actually looking into it and not just making a quick jumping decision. And also, on the other end of that, I want this video to be an encouragement and a message to those who believe in Christ and maybe who don't believe in Christ and that this will push them to Christ, that this will push them towards the Bible, that this will encourage their faith and strengthen their faith in a book where there are legitimate questions to be asked. I want people to look at this rationally, logically, reasonably, and come to a reasonable conclusion and have a reasonable faith that Jesus Christ is God, that He is who He said He is, and that He can be trusted. It's not just some prophet or some madman in the Middle East, but that He was the Son of God, sent from the Father, filled with the Holy Spirit, with a divine message of forgiveness and love and peace and goodwill to man. It's the week before Christmas, doggone it, so I'm allowed to say that right now. And again, to those of you who will believe this, just as I encourage people who doubt me to look into it further, please don't just take my word for it. I want this to point in a certain direction, obviously. Uh, my channel and this video are incredibly biased, and I'm going to be biased because I'm a Christian. And I've come to these conclusions, and this is a topic that I, I encourage at the very beginning. Please come to a conclusion on... Don't just take my word for it. If this is what the capstone, like James White's, this one debate was my capstone. If this video is a capstone for you, that is great. If this is a brand new issue to you, I would encourage you so strongly to look into the particulars as I have, to think about this more deeply as I have. Maybe not take 20 years, but honestly devoting a year or two, and thinking strongly about it, you know, looking into it every few days would not be a bad idea. You know, you don't have to, and I certainly don't want anyone to fall away as I did, but at the same time, I don't regret my falling away because it made me the man who I am today. It strengthened my faith in Jesus Christ. It brought me closer to Him as a result. God took that stumbling block and made it a stepping stone, and now I'm on my way to heaven. Well, I don't think I was ever off the path to heaven. Um, that's a whole other debate of its own, but I don't think, it, because I never lost an actual faith in Jesus Christ, I don't think I was ever on the path to hell, aside from the fact that, you know, obviously I was born, I was lost, and I needed to be saved. Aside from that, I, once I accepted Jesus at the age of 13, I don't think, even when I fell away, I was going to burn in hell at some point. I believe the grace and the patience of my God is incredibly strong, not to mention the fact that He knew I would come back one day and preserve me alive to come to these conclusions to reunite with him, to do a ministry on YouTube, and to give you, you, this message telling you that he is alive and well, that his word can be trusted, and that right now you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He knew I'd come back, and he knew you needed to hear this. So right now, I want to invite everyone who's listening to this message. I know it's 54 almost minutes in. Thank you so much for watching this entire message. I, part of me wants to say how many people are actually going to watch this in its entirety. I hope a decent number of people do because this message is near and dear to my heart and it is important. And right now, to those of you 
who are on the fence about Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never even heard of him before and this is brand new information to you, but you're feeling persuaded. You need Jesus. You need the God I'm talking about right now. Don't delay. Don't put this on the back burner. Accept Jesus right now. If you need to do your research and you need to do some more thinking, by all means do so. Don't make this decision hastily because I am asking and God is asking for a lifetime and indeed an eternal commitment. If you need time to think about it, take some time at the same time don't put this on the back burner. Don't take a long time debating it. Say, oh, I'm not so sure, so I'll think about it. Oh, excuse me. Ugh. I'll think about it next week. Think about it next month, next year. Don't wait on this. Look into it now. Literally, your eternal soul and your eternal destination does depend on this decision. So don't take a long time thinking about it, debating about it, sitting on the fence. Do your research now. Come to a decision sooner, not later. And to those of you who want to accept Jesus, just accept Him right now as your Lord and Savior. Tell Him you believe in Him, that, you died on the cro- that He died on the cross for your sins, that He rose again from the dead three days later to guarantee you eternal life. Say it in your own words, and if you want some words to follow, follow this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus... I admit I'm a sinner. I admit that I need you to forgive me of the sins I committed. I believe that you died on the cross, shedding your blood so my sins could be forgiven. And I believe you rose again three days later, guaranteeing me eternal life. Thank you so much, Jesus, for hearing this prayer. And thank you for being my Lord and Savior and for guaranteeing me eternal life in heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer and you meant it from the bottom of your heart, then your sins are forgiven. You are a child of God. You are forgiven. You are saved. You are on your way to heaven. Congratulations on the biggest decision you'll ever make in this life. If I can encourage you, read the Bible just a little bit every single day. It, it does have its questions. It does have things that are going to challenge you and some things you're not going to understand. Persevere. Read through it anyway, because by doing so, it'll intellectually engage you. It'll further your thought processes. It'll further your relationship with God. It'll teach you how God thinks and what His thoughts and His mind are. Also, try to find... Excuse me. It's a little late at this time of the day for me. Um, Try to find a church, a group of Bible-believing people who do say that the Bible is the Word of God. If they say it's inerrant, infallible... I may not be able to agree with those exact terms, but you know what? It's close enough to the truth because the Bible is definitely the Word of God. I may say there are some errors, there are some contradictions here and there, but I would still say it's the Word of God. It can be understood. You can look at the verse and make a determination and say, okay, this is the proper verse. This isn't. This textual variant shouldn't be here. This textual variant should. You can with study, make intelligent determinations, even as a lay person. Um, so look into that. Um, find some people who believe in the Bible, that believe Jesus is God, and who can encourage you, and you can make new friends with. And also, shoot up a little prayer every day. Don't have to be an hour long and just be a simple, God, thank you for the day, or God, help me, this day sucks. That's a prayer that God, that is precious to God, that He hears and will answer. Guys, that's the end of this message. Thank you so much for bearing with me all the way to the end. This message has been something that's been on my heart since I started this channel. And this chapter was simply a way for me to get it out. There may or may not be a part 3 to 2 Chronicles 15, but thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for hearing me out for almost an hour here. I love you. Whether you believe what I'm saying or not, And God bless.